In this episode, you're going to hear about four more activities that you can add to your teacher toolbox that you can do with your students as soon as tomorrow and you can get ready to have in your classroom next week. You can see all the links to what I'm going to be talking about because I have blog posts that go along with all of them in the show notes or you can go right to wlclassroom.com slash ep36, wlclassroom.com slash ep36, episode 36 of the World Language Classroom podcast, where you can also get all the links to these activities that I'm going to tell you about. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom Podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and thank you so very much for being here to look at your teaching each week and to really find those best ways to be teaching your students in your classroom. Just make sure that you are liking or subscribing, whatever the app is asking you to do, that you might be listening to this episode on so that you get podcast episodes every Monday when they come out of the World Language Classroom podcast. So this is going to be our second installment of the Teacher Toolbox series. So a couple of times a year, I'm going to make sure to have an episode that is all about those activities that you can do in your classroom either right away or really soon. There was a really good response to the first episode I did, and I saw that teachers were tweeting out and putting in Facebook groups that they were trying some of the activities right away in their classroom, and they were successful. So I'm really excited to bring you the second installment of our Teacher Toolbox series. So there are four activities that I want to talk about that we can do in the classroom and I like to give you different ways to use them so you can use them with novice level students, intermediate level students, so that they're not just for one sort of type of class, but you can use them with many classes. So you can use the same activity with a novice mid and an intermediate mid class. You're just going to just maybe change it a little bit, and we'll talk about the ways that you could do that. So the first activity I don't really have a name for it. I'm calling it my Bitmoji classroom because that's how I started using it. This started back in sort of the height of the pandemic when we were all mostly remote. And so teachers were doing Bitmoji classrooms. You probably saw them out on social media where teachers were getting their Bitmojis, which are those little characters that look like them, resemble them. And you could create a virtual classroom. We're usually doing it sort of on Google Slides or something. And you were able to put clickable links on there so students could go in and interact with the classroom and see a little emoji of you on there. So that's really where it started. And this is one of those situations where I started using these virtual Bitmoji type classrooms with my students during the pandemic, uh, particularly right at the beginning when we went completely remote, everyone. And at that time, I wanted to make this as interactive as possible. And what I ended up doing is when we came back into the physical classroom, I brought it with us and we actually continued to do these activities because they were really useful and helpful for students and they enjoyed them. They actually asked for them. So when we look at what happened in the pandemic, I mean, clearly it has been a rough time for so many of us in dealing with it and what it meant in the school or out of school. But I also like to point out that there were some opportunities and some of those opportunities were doing things that we never had done before because we had to find new ways of doing things. And this was one of those. And I'm still doing it in the classroom. And I would not have found this if I did not have the opportunity, I will say, during the pandemic to try something new like this. There are links in the show notes to my blog post on this so you can actually look at what the classroom looks like if you want to set up your own. 
So it's just on a Google slide. So it's nothing really technically advanced. It's really just a Google slide that you put pictures on. And so what I did is I made three versions of the Google slide. One was who is our guest today? One is what's in the box? And one is where are we? And so the who is our guest today, you'll see that it's just a door, like a classroom door. And all students need to do is ask questions until they can figure out who the guest behind the door is for the day. And it was so wonderful and useful for students asking so many questions to try to figure out who it is. And you'll see, like, I put on the screen on, in the classroom, there's like a poster on the wall where it has some different types of questions they can ask, but they're just sort of samples. But once they get into it, they really start asking, like, who is that guest going to be today? And so I've continued to do this in the classroom. I do it about twice a week as sort of a starter activity for students. And sometimes you could put a politician behind there. I know we were in the midst when we first started doing it of political campaigns. So I put some of the candidates behind there. You could do famous singers. You could do people that are in movies. You could do people that are around your school, different teachers or different students, you know, athletes, writers, characters from a book or a movie or something that you're reading in class so that students are just asking questions almost like a 20 questions type of situation they can be yes or no they can be information questions it really doesn't matter there are no rules to it the whole point is that you want them to be intrigued and engaged to figure out who the mystery guest behind the door is going to be so usually the questions go on for maybe a minute or two and the class as a whole eventually start to figure it out you know because it doesn't have to be a person that's alive it doesn't have to be a real person so they'll start asking questions like alive or dead real or fiction and then they might ask questions about what languages they speak or where might they live or what's their ethnicity or what are they known for. As they're using all that language, they eventually are able to zero in and figure out who it is that's behind the door. And then I just have the animation set to when I click enter that the door disappears and they see the person that's behind it. So that's one of the ways of using the Bitmoji Classroom. The other one is what's in the box. So rather than a door, you'll see that there's like this big, looks like a treasure box. That's what I use. You could use anything. And I just put a picture behind it. It could be anything that you have studied in the past. You just don't want it to probably be a person because you already did that with the who's behind the door. But they can ask about whether it's classroom objects or furniture or clothing or sports equipment. It's really good if it's a way of reviewing some vocabulary you've done in the past and then they start really asking questions about different categories. You know, is it a pizza, piece of sports equipment? Or is it food? Is it something you eat for dessert? Uh, is it a tool? Is it something you use in the classroom? Is it something I would find in my house? Is it a way of getting somewhere? Is it outside or inside? And then they ask all these questions and eventually figure out what that is. And the excitement is the big reveal at the end when they can see if they were right when they start asking. The the last version of this is the screen that I call Where Are We? And I use a very cool website called Window Swap. It's window-swap.com. And people from around the world submit pictures that are looking out a window of their house or their apartment or the place that they live. So they take a picture out the window like what they see and they submit it to this website and it, it's all good stuff there's nothing you never come across anything bad or inappropriate and so you put it on and students just by looking at it they start to ask questions and you can see in advance where it is so sometimes I take a screenshot of it so I can make sure that they don't see the the name of the place because sometimes that comes up and then they start asking questions. Sometimes they might see words written somewhere so they can figure out the language. And then they can start asking questions about the weather or what you might do there. And then once they figure out where it is, then we go a little further and we start creating a little story like who might live in this place? Who wouldn't live in this place? Do you think there are children? Do you think it's a family? But it's all based on this just looking out into the world um, through somebody's window. So 
all of these, the who's our guest, what's in the box, where are we, all of these things are really just a fun and interactive way for students to ask questions. They ask a lot of questions that begin with yes or no, and then even more informational questions. So it's it's just a really fun and engaging way, and you might even ask students if they want to send you pictures or suggest people to put behind the door and to put in the box that they're guessing, and then they're the ones that will answer the questions of their classmates as they're going through. Really good class starters. I was doing it every day for a while during the pandemic. It's a little old when you do it every day, but once or twice a week, it can get pretty exciting and the students do enjoy it. And it's a way of using the target language for students to ask questions. So another activity that goes along with that is another one that I call also Guess Who? Now, this one does not involve technology. And again, there is a link to my blog post about this with some visuals also in the show notes. And with this, I choose five students and they go to the front of the room and I give them a folder. And in the folder, there are two pictures. They each have two pictures and they're all different. So there are 10 pictures total. So each student has two individual pictures. Now, the rest of the class has to figure out by asking them questions who has which pictures. So they know in advance that there are 10 pictures of these things. So you'll see that I give them a sheet of paper where it has the 10 pictures across the top, and they will write the students' names down the left-hand side of the piece of paper so that they can keep track for each object. So if I ask a student, do you have the pencil, say it's all classroom objects, and the student says no, then they will go to the column under pencil and that student and put an X there because they know that's eliminated, it's not that person. So going through, say let's just go with classroom objects again. Every time a student in the class asks a question, then they answer either yes or no, they mark that on their sheet. So if they get a student who says, yes, I have that, then they mark no for everyone else because they know there's only one person out there that has it. And then it becomes this strategy, and it's this process of elimination and getting there. And once they guess two objects of any one student, then they know that they're out and they've got all of their objects. So what I do is I go in the same order in the classroom. So it's always going in the same order of the students asking the questions. I say you can't ask any one student two questions in a row. Even if you know what it's going to be and it's not your turn, you're not going to ask that question. Now, that's a very novice way of doing it is using, oh, just concrete vocabulary like that. But you can kick it up a notch. You can go up through proficiency levels. So you can still do it with something like classroom objects and use the same pictures of classroom objects. But rather than simply yes or no, do you have this? You could say, do you have the pencil? And the student has to respond with a pronoun and say, yes, I have it or no, I don't have it. So it's kicking it up a notch in terms of proficiency. You could have pictures of students doing activities and you could have them ask in different time frames. Are you doing that right now? Did you did you take a walk yesterday? Are you going to eat at a restaurant tomorrow? So even though they're just pictures of activities, depending on the proficiency level, you can have students engaging in this at different in different time frames. You could have them using reflexive verbs or something like that. Um, some that are reflexive, some that aren't, so they get used to the interplay between them. But the whole point of it is they're engaging and they're trying to find this strategy to figure out who has what pictures or it could really be anything. It could be uh, pictures of weather. It could be days of the week. It could be anything on there that are a starting point. And then the prompts and the way you have them ask the questions is what's going to move it up in the proficiency levels. So those first two were all about sort of asking questions because we need to do more of that in the classroom. So there was that Bitmoji classroom with the who's our guest, what's in the box, where are we, or this guess who game where students are trying to figure out who has what pictures behind the folder that they're holding. The next activity I want to talk about is one called chat stations. Now, this is not necessarily about asking questions, so it's a little bit of a departure from that. And this idea 
originated with Jennifer Gonzalez at the Cult of Pedagogy, wonderful website. She does wonderful work with teachers, not specific to language, just education in general. And I saw this idea of chat stations, which I believe originally was meant for a history class, the way that she talks about it, but I modified it for our language classrooms. And so so what you do is you set up five or six or seven stations around the room that are simply a picture or a short text. That picture could be a picture of something that you're studying. It could be an ad. It could be an authentic resource, or it could be a short excerpt of a chapter that you're reading or something that you saw on social media, but something that the student's going to engage with. So you'll have at each station to start, you will send groups of two or three, depending on how many you have in your classroom, and you're going to give them a prompt to engage with whatever that image is that they're seeing. And you're going to have them there for about three minutes. You don't want them there for more than three minutes, because after three minutes, each group is going to rotate to the next picture because they're all going to be different. They're all going to be different ads, different excerpts, but they're not going to be doing the same thing at each of these stations. So if they're a novice level group, you could have them just identify what they're seeing in the picture. There might be just colors or it's a certain scene where they can say what the weather is or what the date might be or what month it is or the season. That's very novice level. So you're going to have them do that and then maybe put it into a whole sentence of what they would do during that time. The more intermediate, you wouldn't necessarily have that simple of a picture. It could be an ad for something and you could say who is the ideal client to purchase what they're selling in this ad and why. So they have to sort of figure out the language that's used, what is being sold, who would need that, and sort of talk through it that way. And again, only spending two to three minutes and then moving on to the next station. There are some ways of going about it where you can keep it totally just speaking and oral. And it's a great way for you as the teacher to insert yourself in little conversations as you're going around. You get some good formative information. You can do some embedded recasts with the language if you don't hear things exactly accurate. So you can be a part of it and engaging with the students as they're going. Another way to do it is maybe set up a laptop at each of the stations where students have to record what they have noticed or said about it. And before they engage at the new station, they have to read the other things students have wrote because they're not going to repeat anything. They have to try to add something new to it. But this whole idea of chat stations is you're looking at a maybe 20 to 30 minute activity, but students are going to be at five or six or seven different stations throughout and engaging with a new topic each time. But it's the same sort of prompt. And by the time they get to the third or fourth one, they've had some great practice with it, but then they're doing it with new content rather than doing the same thing each time. So that's chat stations. And again, that is also going to be in the show notes, uh, the blog post that I have about chat stations and using those in your classroom. The last activity I want to talk about is zut o caramba, as I call it. Uh, But it's whatever the word is in your language that means like, oh, shucks, darn it, shoot. And so in this activity, you want to start by having about 30 to 35 pieces of paper. And I'm going to use the classroom object example again, and I'll talk about higher proficiency after. So on those 30 to 35 pieces of paper, you want to have a picture of a classroom object. Now, you're probably not going to have 30 to 35 individual classroom objects. So you might have some that are repeat pictures of two or three of them. So that is going to go into a bag, and then you're going to have about five pieces of paper that say zut or caramba, whatever it is, the, the word for shucks or darn it in your language, and you're going to put that in the bag with the others. So if you're doing it as the whole class, you want to have students in groups of three or four. And so when it's their turn, they're going to get the bag. They are going to pull out a card. And if it is, say, a picture of a pen, they will identify, oh, it's a pen. Very novice level, single word answer. If that is correct, then they put the card down in front of them, and that counts as one of their points. They pass the bag on to the next team. They do the same thing. They pull something out. They identify what it is. It moves on. 
if it gets to a team and then what they pull out is the bad word, the zoot caramba, whatever the word is in your language for shoot, darn it, then they have to put all of their cards that they've won so far back into the bag along with the bad card, and then the bag goes on to the next team. So what happens is as you move on, you'll end up with teams that might have three or four points, the cards in front of them, and then they'll get the Zut card, and oh, they have to put it all back in. So the points constantly change as it's going around. So I use the example of classroom objects, which, again, is a very novice level way of looking at it, very concrete single word answers. But the prompts can be much higher. So you could have something like a picture of an activity, and the group has to say that they did that activity. So again, they have to put it in the past. Did that activity when, where, and with whom. So they're putting together a full sentence all in the past. If they are not at that point where they can do different time frames, they could just identify in the present tense what the person is doing in the picture. Or if you're going through, this has worked really well when you're reading a story or you've read an article about something, you could put a piece of information from it and they have to add on to it. Like if it's a character's name from the story, they have to describe the character. If it is a word that was important in an article about, say, the environment, that they have to add on to it. So I want to just move out of this idea that it has to be these single concrete words that are going to be the answers because the the prompt can be a higher proficiency level but you're actually sort of using the same materials so the other way of doing it is in small groups so i gave the example of doing it the whole class but you could have students just doing it say in a group of five and they each have their own set and so they'll just pass it between the students individually it goes a lot faster that way and the points change a lot more than when you're doing it as the whole class the value in the whole class is you can hear the student answers, but when they're in the groups, more students are speaking more often, so they have that opportunity to do that. So you'll also see the link to my blog post on playing this game in the classroom as well in the show notes, so be sure to look at that. So you will see the links to the Bitmoji classroom for the who's our guest today, what's in the box, where are we, the guess who with the students going to the front of the room, the chat stations, and the Zut Karamba. You'll see the links to all those in the show notes, and you'll also be able to see them if you go to wlclassroom.com slash ep36 for episode 36. So wlclassroom.com slash ep36. Okay, thank you very much for listening today. Hopefully you can take some of these ideas. If you don't use them exactly the way you, that you heard about them today, no worries worries. Use it your way. If you modify it, if you find a way to make it more effective, we'd love to hear about it. Please share it out on Twitter at, and tag wlclassroom.com. So check the show notes for all the links so you can see more of those. You'll also see the link to sign up for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and tools for language teaching. And also the link if you'd like to work together. I can come and work with you and your teachers in your school, or we can even do it remotely, okay? I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.